Stanford University. Thank you so much for that um, kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I thought I'll give you a talk about a recent paper that we wrote, and this title about a new industrial revolution was provoked uh, by this article. And the article I'm talking about is the following. It is uh, a paper that we wrote that Secretary Chu and I co-authored uh, and came out last month called Opportunities and Challenges for a Sustainable Energy Future. And I thought I'll, in this talk I'll give you some insights about why we said a few things and perhaps a little bit more than what we published in this because there are two areas, two really important areas that we did not cover. Number one, we did not cover the grid, extremely important, um, and we did not cover energy efficiency, which is, is very, very important issues. But before I do that, I thought I'll give you an idea of how this paper came about. And there's a story behind it. And the story goes that before I was leaving the Department of Energy, the journal Nature contacted uh, both of us independently without realizing we actually talked to each other pretty often. <laughs> and um, said that, could you write a cover piece on a set of four review papers that were going to be published? And so I said, you know, instead of just me writing it, let me talk to the secretary and see if he would co-author the paper. And he said, well, you know, I didn't quite respond to that email, but uh, if, you're, if you're going to do it together, let's do it. So he said, OK. So we wrote back to them. And we told them that you know, covering the whole of energy in 1,800 words is kind of really hard. Um, so they gave us uh, freedom. And it turned out to be an 8,000-word paper, over 10 pages in nature. And we said, that, oh, let's, go and, you know, let's write it out. And you know, little did we realize what we were getting into. Because after a while, when we committed to a deadline, we realized we don't have a students and postdoc to help us. <laughs> so we had to do everything, uh, including all the reference search and, and you know, the fixing the reference formats, everything. And we spent about four all-nighters on this. And a typical all-nighter would go like this. You know, he would work till about, and this is in fact what happened, he would work till about 3 in the morning and email me the draft. And I'm in California, it would come at 12 midnight. And I would work till 4 in the morning and send it back to him at 7 o'clock out there. He would work for an hour or so, then he had to go to work. He has a job out there. And so then in the middle of the day, he would call me and say, Arun, uh, I can spend about two hours today. I've got to talk to the president. I've got a few senators to deal with. And I've got this nuclear issue. Uh, I can only spare two hours. What about you? And I said, how the heck do I beat that? <laughs> so I had to put up a straight face and a very serious voice and said, Mr. Secretary, you know, I've, got to, I've got to walk my dog. I've got, to cook, <laughs> I've got to cook lunch for my daughters. I can spare, I think, about six hours today. <laughs> anyway, so that was the, the, the paper. It was a lot. It was labor of love to put it together. And we put our thoughts. And, we, and a lot of people have called for an industrial revolution. We thought we'll put some, some facts and numbers behind it as to what it would take. And the industrial, since we call it industrial revolution, it's important to understand what happened in the industrial revolution, which began in the mid 1700s. And before the industrial revolution, in fact, we use the word horsepower to horsepower. Because before the industrial revolution, this is how we move things is animal power and horses. And perhaps you could put eight horses in front of you and go fast. But that's about it. And now, with the Industrial Revolution that has happened over the last 250 years, we have this. If you want to go to the grocery store from your home, you would get into a car with, which has 300 horses in front of you, and you would go. If you want to take a high-speed train, you got about you know, a 10,000 horse, and you fly across the continent, which used to take you know, months or more. Now you can do it about five or six hours with, you know, with 100,000 horses taking you there. OK, so that has been the transformation. And it's not only just in mobility. It's been you know, in our automation in our factories, automation mechanization of our agriculture. In homes, we have CFLs and LED lighting. Air conditioners 
is a new concept if you look at it historically. It's a totally new concept. It's happened only in less than 100 years. And so if you, if you look at this, you realize that it's all been about how we utilize energy. It's all been about energy. And, but the net impact of that has been this. The global GDP per capita increased exponentially. Okay, so the productivity, the prosperity that we have has increased exponentially. But that is also, as I said, has been due to how we use energy. And this is the use of energy, and this is coal, oil, uh, natural gas, and nuclear, and the rest out here, mostly but fossil energy. And you'll notice that this x-axis is not the same as out here. In fact, if you put it on the same curve, it's like this. That's been the exponential use of our fossil energy and the exponential prosperity. But that is not the only increase that has happened over the Industrial Revolution. It's not just GDP per capita. The number of people has gone up. So it is now, as you can see out here, we had, let's say, about 700 million people before the Industrial Revolution, right before, and now we have 7 billion, 10x. Okay? And in the recent history, the population has gone up substantially over the last 100 years, primarily because of science and engineering. The Haber-Bosch process helped, you know, saved people from famine and around the world and changed the ball game so that people could actually eat. Agriculture changed because of the Haber-Bosch process of fixing nitrogen, breaking the triple bond, and making ammonia, so that which became a precursor for, you know, for fertilizers. And now, today, we have 7 billion people in the world. And you ask the question, what's going to happen to the population? There was a recent study with the United Nations. Uh, the average expectation is about 10 billion people by the end of the century, which is 3 billion more. And the error bar is also 10 billion. So that's, you know, that's the state of affairs. We don't know exactly where it's going to be. And it really depends on the fertility of women, really, in Africa. And that's what it turns out to be. But let's take the average, 3 billion more people in the world. If we want that exponential growth in our economies, in our prosperity, okay, which we all want, and if, you want this, and if you have this increase in population, the question is, do we have enough energy to sustain that? So let's look at what we have done in the past in terms of oil and gas and ask the question, is there enough oil and gas? And here, so here's you know, oil, gas, and reserves and production. This is of the global oil reserves that are, the, you know, and what you find is over the years, the number of amount of reserves is actually going up because the technology for discovery and production has kept pace and sometimes surpassed the demand to the point that there is no peak oil as far as we know. The amount of oil that we can access is going up. In fact, over the last decade or so, the amount of capacity Production capacity that has been uh, developed suggests that we may actually have increased oil production, especially in North America and in South America. This is uh, tw 2011. This is 2020. And you can see this is United States. United States, Canada uh, will increase its production to the point it's, there's a very good chance that we can reduce our oil imports, which is now about 45%, down to about 35% or so, and perhaps even, even better which is great in terms of balance of trade issues, but, you know, uh, and, but we still have potentially a security problem as well. I won't go into that, but nevertheless, the production may actually go up significantly. Well, what about gas? This is the gas reserves without counting US shale, global gas reserves, and you can see that is also increasing because the ability to discover and produce has, is, is keeping pace with the demand. And this is including shale gas. It's actually pretty, that's, that's been a huge game changer in the United States. So as you can see, gas reserves are also going up. So in terms of availability of fossil fuel, at least for the next 50 to 100 years, we have enough. The question is, what about other impact? And as you all know, you know there is something called global warming. Somehow in Washington, you know, people don't quite talk about it anymore. But it's happening. And I'm not going to talk about you know, how much CO2 is going up, whether the temperature. We all know that the global average temperature is going up. It's gone up by about 0.8 degrees from the, from the norm. But what people haven't talked about is that, and people, you know, a lot of people will ask, how does it affect me? 
Okay, the average temperature is going up by 0.8 degrees. And what people haven't talked about is not just the average, but the distribution of temperature. It doesn't, it's average is great, it's only 0.8, so how does it affect me? So at last month, there was a paper that came out about not just the average, but the distribution of temperatures around the world. And this is what it looks like, and I'll play a movie for you. This is a Gaussian distribution, horizontal axis is in terms of normalized by standard deviation. This is the 50s, the temperatures, this is hot, this is cold. And that's what's happening. Okay? So this average motion is average is going up, and by the way, this is only summer temperatures, okay? And, but summer has you know, cold and hot fluctuations as well. This is the average, okay? But if, as you can see, the distribution has broadened, and not only that, it is reaching five sigma of the original standard deviation. And you ask, the, and this is globally average distribution. You ask the question, where is it happening? And so this paper also has a very interesting chart of the extremes of weather and the geographical location. And you find out here, this is, you know, out here, pink is minus, below minus three sigma, and brown, dark brown, is above three sigma. And of course, this is now 1955, 65, 75, 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. As you can see, there's an unmistakable trend that you see more brown than pink. Okay, and you find that here in 2010 was the heat wave in, in Russia, in Moscow, where there were several deaths. And I suspect in 2012, when the data comes out, this, these are satellite maps, when the data comes out, you'll find that happening in the United States, in the Midwest, that happened this year. And in fact, if you look at the, compare the data, what happened, this, is, this summer was hotter than all the dust bowls that happened in the 1930s, okay? So this is what is going on, and this is a real effect, and this is the first paper that at least I found looking at the distribution and the extremes compared to the global average. And this is something of concern. So the question that we could ask is, okay, how much CO2 have we emitted? So here's a question. How much, CO, how much is the cum cumulative CO2 emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? And if you do the numbers, it's on the order of about a trillion tons of CO2. Then he asked the question that we have emitted over the last 250 years. Then he asked the question, given how much more CO2 can we emit based on known fossil fuel reserves, based on today's known fossil fuel reserves, if you emit all of them, how much would it be? And based on today's reserves, it's about three trillion tons more, three times, almost three times more than what we have emitted. And based, and you can ask the question, based on our current use of energy and the growth of CO2 emissions, how much time would it take? And the number comes up to be about 75 to 100 years. So we will emit three times more <laughs> CO2 in one third the time. So about a factor of 10 right there. But here's the, here's the issue. That those three trillion tons of, of carbon which is down in, 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 the, in the fossil reserves, how much is it worth? And that is worth tens of trillions of dollars. So here's the dilemma we face. Do we leave the $10 trillion in the bank and not use it for, for exponential economic growth, or do we, do we do something else? And that's really the dilemma. It's an economic versus environmental, and I think there are economic opportunities in trying to turn the ship around. And so we have in this paper, we quoted a very famous um, oil minister from Saudi Arabia by this quote. The Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> and we added the word, we transitioned to better solutions. And in fact, here is a picture of what we did historically in the United States. This is New York in 1890s, the streets of New York. This is Detroit in 1920. In 30 years, we transformed our transportation system. And you know, one of the reasons was there were 160,000 horses in New York and Brooklyn in 1880, were producing about three to four million pounds of horse manure a day. It was an environmental crisis. Yes, there were a lot of jobs cleaning up and trying to open up pathways and all that. But we transi transitioned to better and cheaper and faster solution. So we could ask the question now, what are the better solutions, the possibly better solutions in the future? 
And what I like to do is to, in a, is to present it as an energy system. We gotta think of it as an energy system. And what does the system look like? Well, there are many ways of skinning the scat. One way to look at it is the following. That you have a stationary system, which is mostly about electricity, some about natural gas, and you got you know, clean energy, uh, clean electricity generation, electricity generation and use in buildings and industry, and you have the grid out here, or you can look at the transportation system, which is where in you know, a fossil fuel oil is used out here and used in vehicles. And these two systems are largely independent of each other. As long as we don't have enough, you know, we don't, today we don't have as much electrification or transportation, but if you do, they will be connected. But today, at least, it's largely disconnected. So we can talk about each of these systems independently, and I'll talk about that. But in each of these areas out here, you can talk about technologies and take two more dimensions to this and see how these technologies have developed. And if you look at these technologies, you could look at it this way. That for each technology in each of those circles, you can divide, you can break up the technology into two axes. On the vertical axis is cost divided by performance, and the horizontal axis scale in size and volume. In energy, cost and scale is everything. And each technology follows a learning curve. That is, the more you do, the cheaper it gets, or the better the performance. And that's a learning curve, and you know, every technology, whether it's air conditioners, batteries, or whatever you can think of, will follow a certain learning curve. And so I'm also going to map out you know, where does technology, so here's where technology innovation happens in the early stages, and then you have innovations in manufacturing, which also needs R&D, but you have scaling to reduce the cost and increase in volume, and at the end of the day, you have deployment. I'm gonna map out where DOE plays a role, the DOE Applied Energy Offices, the Office of Energy Efficiency, Renewable Energy, et cetera, is looking, using science to enable technologies go down this early stage of this learning curve of today's technologies of current learning curves. For example, take the lithium ion battery and let's see, take today's lithium ion batteries, make it safer, cheaper, better, okay? Now, the reason ARPA-E was created was to do the following, was to create entirely new learning curves, translate science into breakthrough technologies where you have, you have a portfolio of approaches, you don't know which one's gonna work. Some of them will fail, which are crosses. We call them not failures, but opportunities to learn and go back again in the drawing board. But there is a chance that some of these technologies will, will scale in such a way that they'll be cheaper and better performance and actually be disruptive to today's learning curve. And then, then that will become the new learning curve. And so that the nation as a whole, hopefully the world, will follow a different pathway. You have suddenly an acceleration in, in making it cheaper an acceleration in, in getting, and an, an economic acceleration, if you may, in taking these technologies and taking a turn in this. But as you scale these technologies from these early stages down, it costs money. And here is the sort of rough order of magnitude at the very, very early stages in R&D, which is government funded. Each project is about, you know, two to five million dollars. It takes about two to five years. And some of them work, some of them do not. There are some failures, but again, you can go back to learning, uh, learning and going back again. But as you go down into manufacturing and scaling, it costs money, orders of magnitude higher. And this is where the government really cannot support. You gotta have private sector and access to capital, low cost, long-term capital, and it takes time to develop all this. You know, that is absolutely necessary. And for deployment, you need markets. And I'm gonna talk about this later on, but this is some of these, uh, this is another way of looking at systems. So what I'm gonna talk about are some of these uh, inflection points, potential inflection points that may happen in the stationary system and in the, um, in the transportation system, which could potentially be better solutions as I was mentioning earlier. So let's talk about the stationary systems. And here is something that we presented in this paper on the levelized cost of electricity. And, and this is, you know, there are various uh, technologies out here, I'm not gonna go to all of them, but I highlighted a few. In terms of electricity generation today, natural gas combined cycle out here is perhaps the cheapest way to produce electricity. 
it's about 50 to $60 a megawatt hour, or five to six cents a kilowatt hour. And you know, the other technologies are more expensive, but here is coal-fired power plants out here. This is wind. And this is, by the way, data from quarter three of 2012. We just ended. So this is the latest data, not on projection. These are actual contracts that have been made. This is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And you find that wind is actually cheaper than coal in many areas. So wind generation, electricity generation from wind is actually cheaper than coal. And PV, the photovoltaics out here are at about $120, $130 a, a megawatt hour. But the green numbers out here, the green and the red, these numbers, the plus and the minus percentage, is the percentage drop in the levelized cost of electricity in one quarter compared to quarter two. And what you find, interestingly, in some of them, you have dropped 9% in one quarter. The module cost in, in photovoltaics have dropped 70% you know, in the last two and a half years. That's what happened. And the question is, you ask the question, can, you, can these technologies ever compete with natural gas combined cycle and perhaps even beat them and be cheaper? Could, could it be possible? So one of the areas, one of the initiatives that we developed in the Department of Energy is what we call Sunshot to do exactly that. This is like what President Kennedy had in a moonshot to go to the moon and return safely within the decade. Well, we can't really go to the sun, but we can certainly reduce the cost of solar electricity, which was the target for this particular one, to reduce the cost of electricity to about $50 a megawatt hour by the end of this decade. And he asked the question, what are the, what's the cost? This is, by the way, what the cost was in terms of installed, fully installed, is about three and a, you know, almost four dollars a watt in 2010. We want to reduce it to dollar a watt. And so the question is, okay, where is the cost coming from? The cost, this blue part is the PV module, and this yellow part is the balance of system. So right away you see the balance of system is actually more than the actual PV modules. What, what is balance of system? It's installation, permitting, and all of the other kinds of things that you got to do. And this is the power electronics part, the green part for inverters and integrated, integrating it to the grid. And our goal was to reduce the cost of the PV module to about 50 cents a watt from $1.70 and, and, and for, for the balance system to 40 cents. It turns out today, the lowest cost module is about 70 cents a watt. Okay, so, in, so this is 2012. In two years, it's come down so much. And there's a very good chance in the next eight years, the module cost will come down to about 50 cents a watt. The question is, will the rest come down? And is there, are there any technological knobs in there to be able to reduce the cost? So I'm going to go through a few. So this is now, it all, it's all about efficiency and manufacturing cost. So this is different kinds of ways of making solar cells. Cattel today, in terms of the, the production level, it's about 14% efficiency. And that's the theoretical limit. Uh, it's, it's slightly below, we cut it slightly below what is called the Shockley Quasar limit. It's about 29% or so. And if you can increase the, the, the efficiency of cattel by even to about 20% or so, this becomes a game changer because it reduces the cost, not just the module cost, but the overall balance of system cost. And this is just a recent work that is 3-5 based. This is a gallium arsenide based material at 20%, 28% efficient on a plastic substrate, which not only makes it more efficient, but also lighter, which reduces the balance of system cost. There's some major innovation. There's a lot of room for improvement in the energy, in the efficiency game by, while reducing the manufacturing cost. A few other things, storage, extremely important. The cheapest way to store electricity is pumped hydro, about $100 a kilowatt hour, if you want to store it at gigawatt hour scale. So we create a program on storage by looking at other technologies to reduce the cost of those to below $100 a kilowatt hour. And we saw some major innovation, not just in new kinds of battery technologies, but compressed air, et cetera. Just to give you one example, this is from MIT, from Yetmin Chang's group, uh, which they spun out into something called 24M. But they've taken the best of lithium ion battery chemistry, fluidized the electrodes, and changed the architecture of the whole battery into a flow battery. And they're, hitting, they're trying to hit a target of $60 a kilowatt hour. Well, even if they don't reach 60, even if they reach 100, this is a game changer in terms of making it modular and, and stationary um, batteries. Uh, so this is very interesting. And there are many others. I'm just giving you some single data points or so. Let me talk about the grid. This is extremely important. We have about a trillion dollars of assets on the grid. And the grid really needs to be looked at as a system. And you got to not just do demand response, but if you have new 
in a generation from renewables coming up, the supply response as well at the same time is very important to be able to balance it in real time, which we don't quite do today in an automated way. And we have things like this also. The grid is aging. And just to give you a data point, the, this is a distribution transformer on a grid. And this is about 8,000 pounds. It handles about a megawatt of power. It operates at 60 hertz. The average age of these devices on the grid is 42 years, and it's two years beyond its projected lifespan. That's where we are. And we asked the question, could we do better? Are there innovations that we can have in this? And just to, so we invested in the power electronics, which is an area that the US government has not invested in a long time. And so here are some wide band gap semiconductor, gallium nitride, silicon carbide based power electronics. Here's a silicon carbide based IGBT, which can handle 15 kilovolts over a 200 micron thick silicon carbide and can 100, 100 amps which is about 1.5 megawatts electrical power. And they're trying to increase the frequency, chopping frequency at 50 kilohertz. And if you do that, the whole transformer becomes about 100 pounds, fits in a suitcase. And there's some major materials issues that need to be resolved in this to do that. But if, you, this, is a, if this works out, this will be a significant progress in the whole solid state power electronics, solid state transformer area. And this becomes the heart of many other integrated devices that I'm not, not going to talk about, but that's, that is something that is likely to happen if this becomes successful. Let me very briefly talk about transportation. This is the distribution of fuel consumption in transportation, mostly light duty vehicles and trucks. A um, lot of opportunities in fuel in efficiency in reducing uh, the fuel consumption by increasing um, the efficiency of, for example, by combustion. There's a tremendous amount of room for improvement in the engines, where different types of combustion you can do instead of spark ignition or compression ignition, but other kinds of combustion to increase the, the efficiency of the engines itself. But we all want to have cars which can go from zero to 60 in five seconds, or four seconds. It's lower the better. But we are increasingly, you need a huge engine to be able to lug all that weight with you to be able to accelerate at, you know, five, you know, within five seconds, zero to 60. What about if you lightweight the car? So here are some really important things that we have to solve in even mild, you know, in, in steel research. So this is the elongation percentage, which is important for manufacturing of steel. And this is the tensile strength. And many, most of the steel that is used in a car are mild strength, which means this is, you know, 300 to 400 megapascals of the tensile strength, which means we need bulk to be able to make it, you know, safer and stronger. Whereas if you go to 1200, we can make the steel, but they don't elongate. It's, it's, not, it's not as ductile. But if you could look at the microstructure, nanostructure to create steel, which can elongate, but also have high tensile, this is a game changer for our transportation business. Not only that, of course, we have carbon fiber, which is expensive today. If you could reduce the cost by a factor of three, this is again becomes a game changer for, um, you know, for transportation. So this is a lot of opportunities for lightweighting. Let me talk about electrification. So if you are to make electric vehicles comparable in range and cost without subsidies, okay, by, by in the next 10 years, what do we need to do? And the majority of the cost, there's a lot of system level in, innovations you can do, but a big chunk of the cost is batteries. So this is where we are today in the usable power in the cost of batteries. It's about $650, about you know, $500 to $600 a kilowatt hour, usable kilowatt hour. And that this is the pack level energy density um, in, in terms of per mass and, and, and by volume. And if you are to go to all electric at the same cost of, you know, at, we need, you know, system level $300 a kilowatt hour of the usable. And, and this pack density, we have to reach about 180, which means at the cell level, you got to roughly say double the value, about 400 watt hour per kilogram at about 100 you know, $300 a kilowatt hour. And you ask the question, is it possible today, even in the lab? And it turns out it is. So this is the battery from a company called Envia, which is right here across the bay, which where they used a manganese-based high-capacity cathode along with silicon, which high-capacity anode, and they actually made it work with a third-party validation. They reached 400 watt hour per kilogram and roughly at around $250 a kilowatt hour, maybe a little bit higher. 
But this is at the lab level. They, of course, have to not start producing these. But at least there's a proof of principle that you can make it, and this could be quite good. In terms of long-haul trucking, there's a big transition going on in using natural gas. And if you look at LNG, long, you know, liquefied natural gas, the additional cost for trucking for LNG is about $100,000. But the fuel saving, if you go to this, between diesel and natural gas is about $40,000 a year. So in two and a half years, you pay it back. And for the, for the fueling station, it costs about $1.6 million per fueling station. And the payback period is also two to three years. So they asked us when we were in DOE, they asked us, what, we sh what should we do? And we basically said, this is economically viable. Get out of the way. And so now the private sector is putting this infrastructure of LNG station all across the United States every 200 miles so that these LNG trucks can actually refuel and go across the country. And this is going on. And by sometime middle of next year, we will probably have the whole infrastructure in place. This is an amazing transformation that is happening. The question is, could we use natural gas in cars today? And of course, as you know, we have Honda Civic CNG. The problem is the infrastructure. If you look at the gasoline stations around the country, there are about 160,000 gasoline stations. And if you were to put a CNG infrastructure like that, it will cost someone more than $100 billion, which is economically, you know, at least the government doesn't have that kind of money. Maybe the private sector does. On the other hand, there are about 60 million homes that has natural gas. So we ask the question, why is it viable then? And it all comes down to the cost of storage. And so storage turns out that's the size of the tank that goes inside a uh, Honda Civic. And if you, could, if you could reduce the cost of the compressor plus the tank as a system to less than $2,000, either by going high pressure, by reducing the cost of multi-stage compressor, compressor or reducing the cost of carbon fiber composite tank, or you using a sorbent material to grab natural gas and, and store it at low pressure, then you can just buy off-the-shelf compressor, which is cheap. So thereby, but we don't have the options right now. And we need a major breakthrough, which is why we created an RPE program to reduce the payback period to about three to about five years. At two thousand dollars, the payback period is becomes five years or so, and this would become then viable. And that is what a program is going on right now. Very briefly about biofuels. Biofuel, if you look at all biofuels today, is photosynthetic. So you can use the photosynthetic mechanism in, in all these you know, plant-like organisms, and you can make oil. I won't go into the details, but except for algae, all the others at least, the, it is about less than 1% efficient. It's very inefficient because the photosynthetic you know, process depends on an, you know, the, what is called the Calvin cycle. And the Calvin cycle has an, has an enzyme called Rubisco, which if you raise the temperature, it reacts with oxygen, and it's a bad thing that happens. I won't go into the details of that, but because of the inefficiency, it increases the cost because you need a lot of land, you need water, and you need to be able to collect all this fluffy material. In fact, we use the word fluffy in our paper to collect all that and bring it and densify it. And so if you look at the cost of biofuel, this is projections 10 to 15 years. This is the cost equivalent per barrel. These are the different technologies. This is the biological. This is coal to liquids. This is biological. Uh, biofuels out here compared to petroleum. And there's a cost of carbon at $50 a ton of CO2 equivalent out here. This is the brown bars out here. And what you find, majority of the cost is was the feedstock. And why is that so? Because you've got to collect and densify. And the optimal radius of curvature of collecting that today, it's about 30 or 40 miles. Okay? Or you could do something like this, which is clearly not viable in the United States. And you, know, you can't do that. Or what Brazil has done is to, is to mechanize the whole process and thereby use economic, economies of scale to reduce the cost. But either we do the engineering part of it in how to densify this fluffy material in biomass to reduce the feedstock cost, or you go into biology and change photosynthesis fundamentally. And that is another RPE program that we created. But there's another, there's a third way. And that is something that we thought about it and one of my colleagues, Eric Toon, was, one of the, was a pioneer in this, is to think about what is biology actually doing? It is using the energy from sunlight to actually fix carbon dioxide, to make carbon-carbon bonds. And you cannot beat biology in terms of specificity of making carbon-carbon bonds. 
And then you ask the question, is Calvin cycle the only way? And the answer is no, there are many other cycles that can make carbon-carbon bonds in biology, and it turns out had never been used to make biofuels. And so we created this program called electrofuel. In fact, we coined the word. And this is how it works. You take energy, either from directly from electrons or from hydrogen sulfide, which is a waste product of oil and gas, or hydrogen, which is a product of natural gas, take CO2 and use non-photosynthetic microbes that use other cycles to fix carbon dioxide and do, that do not rely on Rubisco, the enzyme, and make oil. And no one had ever done this before. From at least from looking at the cycle, it seemed like you could be 10 times more efficient than Calvin cycle, than, than photosynthetic thing. But it was risky. <clears throat> and we said, let's give it a shot. And sure enough, in about one and a half years, this is, uh, there are multiple groups going. This is just the result of one group. This is OPX Biotechnology in, in Colorado and uh, combined with North Carolina State. This is the first vial of a biofuel without using sunlight. And now they're making bottles of these. Hopefully they can scale and be cheap as well. We don't know whether it'll scale or not. But at least there's a proof of principle that biofuels can be made without using sunlight. So what I'm telling you are some new ways of doing things. And if I put, wrap that up again, and if I were to look at the energy system in a sort of a very simplistic straight chain without any complexity, it something looks, looks like something like this. You have R&D to translate science into innovative technology. You've got manufacturing for scaling. And you've got com commercial deployment. You've got markets. And the markets create demand pull for all of these. And if everything is lined up, it goes very smoothly. You've got innovation straight to the market you know, in, a, in a very efficient way. But you need capital to do that. And you need time. You need government R&D, and you need all this. And you need some policies to align all this to create the markets. And so there are all today, in fact, in the United States, the SCAFE standard, which is great. And there are other incentives for deployment in terms of financial incentives, in terms of tax credits and 1603 grants in lieu of tax credits, uh, which have, you know, and then you have 48C is a manufacturing tax credit, all kinds of things. If you look at the, where we are today in the United States, and I'm going to give a scorecard for the United States, I can do that because I can, I'm out of the government right now. <laughs> and ask the question, where are they all? Most of them have ended. There are a few of them that are still continuing. Most of them, incentives and all, have all ended. And you ask the question, where are we? All these things that are going on, some of them create markets, some of them investment you know, for financial policy, financial incentives. You ask the question, how are we doing in the United States? So I'm going to break up into stationary and transportation and then look at markets, financial policy. And here's the matrix in a, in a very simplistic way, perhaps oversimplistic. Stationary system and transportation. The first category is, do we have the capacity for technology innovation? And from at least what I have seen, this is a greed. We have an amazing capacity based on our science and engineering infrastructure to innovate. Should we have a sustained increasing funding for energy? And this is what I worry about, I'm concerned about, whether we can have sustained funding perhaps increasing with a, with a positive slope. Because positive slope sends a signal to all the researchers, this is where perhaps the action is. If it's a negative slope, they go away, do other things, maybe go to Wall Street. Nothing wrong with that. But that, they're not going to focus on energy R&D. So this is, I would say, the capacity to innovate is amazing. Then look at the markets. And I would say I give a yellow to transportation because we have the CAFE standards, which will bring about you know, a demand pull for new technologies to be able to meet 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025. And we have in, in California low carbon fuel standards. If you look at the stationary side, it's a red. We don't have a carbon price. Clean energy standards has been proposed. In fact, Senator Bingaman has introduced it, but I don't know exactly where it's going to go. Applying standards is only the good news story out here. If you look at financial policies, it is a red because all some of the tax credits are ending and or ended. And we need to have, I won't go into the detail, tax policy to be able to reduce the cost of capital. Because if you look at the levelized cost of electricity, there are two major costs. One is the capital cost, and one is the, one is the cost of capital, of financial capital. And that has to be reduced, and there are mechanisms to do that. 
uh, there are, if you are to give financial incentives, make it term lim time limited and predictable. Not year after year, you bring it on, production tax grid goes away, then production tax grids again. That's a horrible way to run this country. But this is where we are. And perhaps if you could do a few, we can align the incentives to go from R&D all the way to deployment. And people, a lot of people think that regulation is bad and it increases the cost. Here is a counterproof to that. If you do it the right way, these are appliance standards, this is the price, and there are two, two costs out here. One is the life cycle cost of refrigerators, and the other is the first cost that a consumer pays. This is the price for the consumer. And what you find is the refrigerators, room AC, this is an analysis where Secretary Chu has done some economic analysis now himself with his colleagues out here, which has been submitted to science. Hopefully, it'll come out. That when you introduce these, uh, this dotted dash line are the California appliance standards, and the solid line is when is the federal appliance standards come in. And what you find is that as soon as the, the standards are brought in, it is expected that the life cycle cost will come down because things become more efficient. What is surprising is that the first cost that what you pay for the equipment also comes down. And this has to do with the equation between price and efficiency. That equation changes when you bring in innovation. So if you do the standards the right way, innovation cannot, can move and the competition that happens brings down both the costs. It actually becomes cheaper in equivalent dollars if you, have, if you do it the standards the right way to bring down the cost of the equipment itself that you want to buy. And I think that is something that we need to le learn lessons from this and perhaps use it in other places. So let me end my talk by saying that this is the transition the United States has taken, the time to transition from fuels, from wood to coal to hydro, et cetera. And it takes about 50 years to transition between different sources of energy. I'm not sure we have the time to do that because other things will happen as well. So we ended a paper, our paper with which a quote which is sort of like Yogi Berra quote, that if you don't change the direction soon, we'll end up where we're heading. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I agree with you completely on the time factor. We're, we don't have a lot of time. Can, this is going to take a second, but can you go back to the slide where you have all the costs of the different energy sources? Uh, this is the levelized cost? Yeah, the levelized cost. <clears throat> yep, this one? Yeah, so, what's, so you have natural gas on the bottom, then mm -hmm. coal, and what's the one on top, right on top of coal? It's over. Right on top of coal is nuclear. So I, I wanted to ask about your thoughts on nuclear energy. You, you didn't really cover it in this presentation. It's there in the paper, though. Well, well, I'd like to hear your thoughts now, I guess. Uh, I'll read your paper. <laughs> <laughs> but, but read the paper. No. <laughs> I, I will, I will. But nuclear energy is a million times more efficient than yes. fossil fuels. And, you know, we have, we're basically, we could either move higher in terms of energy density, or we could, you know, grow bio crops, which is much which is moving backwards from fossil fuels. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, one is for electricity, the other is for fuels, but. Um, Absolutely, nuclear has to be an option. There is, by the way, there's no silver bullet out here. Nuclear has to be an option given its carbon. In fact, a lot of the utilities are thinking of nuclear and actually investing. We, have built, we are building the first nuclear power plant in 30 years. And, and, and that is because, you know, the utilities, and they want options for the future. Yes, natural gas is the cheapest one today. But you know, who knows what the natural gas prices are going to be in the future? Okay, so it, it's really important to have to hedge the risk for the future. And a lot of people in, and now, what what we found, the biggest risk for nuclear plants is that is that the capital needed for building a gigawatt a power plant is so large, you sometimes have the utilities have to bet the whole utility on that, and that becomes too much of a financial risk. So we started this initiative in DOE called the Small Modular Reactors. 
where you, you reduce the size to about a few hundred megawatts, and the capital needed for that is about a billion dollars, and that's doable. And so it's, it's a purely financial risk issue in nuclear. Of course, there's technology re needed to reduce the cost. And if you go to small modular reactors, you can modularize it, perhaps build it in a factory and assemble it out there, and that could reduce the cost as well. So it's, at the end of the day, it's an economic issue. And uh, I think there are opportunities perhaps to reduce the cost of construction cost of building a nuclear plant. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, how about uh, more students? I have a question. I'm in the natural gas and coal trail. It seems now, for regulation and other reasons, there are fewer coal plants being built. But if natural gas becomes more expensive, you think that will kind of be reversed and increased reliance on coal? Yeah, I mean, coal fire power plants, you know, yeah, natural gas is cheaper. In fact, this year, it used to be that 50% of electricity came from coal and about 23% came from natural gas. This year, they're about equal, about 30-something. It's the first time it's happened in the history of, of the United States that they're about equal. So there's an economic issue. There are issues about, you know, regulations, about mercury. In fact, that EPA is now proposing uh, what is called the MACT rule. And that will have cost associated with it because you may have to put scrubbers, not you may, you will have to put scrubbers and to reduce the mercury level um, on coal-fired power plants. And that you know, is additional cost. So they have to make the judgment of whether to shut down the plant and go for natural gas or whether to continue doing that and put a scrubber. But business as usual, you know, the, the pollution level of these old coal-fired power plants from the 60s or so, you know, that's an issue. And the cost is certainly high. But many of them are fully amortized. So, and many of the nuclear plants, by the way, are fully amortized. If you can continue the, uh, if you can, you know, retrofit some of these nuclear fire power plants, et cetera, and keep them going for a while and still keep them safe, the cost of electricity from those, from those amortized nuclear and coal is like two or three cents a kilowatt hour. It's really cheap. And you're making money. It's a cash cow then. Okay. All right. Yeah. How about right there? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, many of us are soon to be entering the workforce, and we sort of make technology bets by the field that we decide to go into within the broader energy landscape. Are there any technologies that you see great growth that uh, you think would be a great place for us to head after? School? We should talk to Jamie Strobel out there, who's uh, in Tesla, CEO of Tesla. He might give you a job. <laughs> No, I think, you know, if you look at, <laughs> um, you, you know, if you look at the whole energy landscape, and I only talked about most of the United States, think about globally. The population is going up. There's a tremendous demand for energy. Uh, and, for example, um, you know, in many of the developing economies, there's a huge, you know, potential for introducing new technologies out there and bring down the cost where people don't have access to electricity today. About a billion and a half people who don't have access to electricity today. And to enable them is actually a business opportunity. Okay? And if you do that, they come into this modern lifestyle of using information and other things and health. All the human development index actually increases. So there's a huge opportunity out there. But even in the United States, I mean, if you look at the, the whole market, that is, I talked about the market side, you know, the cafe standard becomes a demand pool and you'll find a lot of the electrification and other technologies that are happening to increase the fuel efficiency standards of these cars. That's a great story. And I think you'll see a lot of that happening. Unfortunately, as, you, as I've mentioned, on the electricity side, you know, I wish there are better, better you know, policies to create the market. But as I mentioned, the grid, there is, you know, it's an aging infrastructure. There's many of the utilities and all are going to hit what is called the asset wall. Because some of these assets have to go away. <laughs> and there'll be new assets that'll be put. The question is, do we put the same old devices? And that's a very low risk way of doing it, which is, you know, which is maybe one of the ways. Perhaps a better way is to test out some of the new technologies, which are cheaper and better, okay? so that they get introduced into the, uh, into the electricity system. And I think there's a huge opportunity out there as well. And then we'll sort of move to more broadly. Yeah, how about you? Uh, several big uh, conventional energy companies are investing in uh, natural gas. They're betting high on natural gas, and they're investing in big assets. 
uh, natural gas driven assets. So that's obviously driving a lot of the energy capital towards conventional energy. How is that um, affecting capital required for uh, uh, development of new development? Yeah, you know, th that is true. Actually, natural gas has both a positive and a negative effect that um, on the renewables and everything. It's, it's a competition, as I mentioned. Um, oops. I wanted to present this out here. A lot has to do with the cost of capital, okay? And you see this, um, this, uh, this plot that I, or this matrix that I put out there. And there's something called MLP, Master Limit Partnership, and one of the experts is right here, Dan Riker. He wrote an article in the New York Times on that. And this has to do with tax policy. I won't go into the detail, but it reduces the tax burden, okay? So that the cost of capital for lending for a project, for project finance, actually goes down. And cost of capital for renewables is, is, is huge because there is no fuel cost, okay? And there's no operating cost. So it turns out, by law, which was created in the early 1980s, these, this tax policy only applies for oil, gas, and coal. It does not apply for solar, wind, and other renewable energies. Okay, that's just the law. And so it's not a level playing field. And there's now a bill that has been introduced to create parity and create a level playing field between the cost of capital, which turns out to be a big cost, between all of energy, let's go equal, all of energy. And that I think, I hope it goes through, we'll see in the next session of Congress, um, whether it actually happens or not. Uh, so you talked about the paper bond process and how uh, that, that sort of uh, solved the problem of having 7 billion people in the world. Presumably, if you go to 10 billion people, uh, maybe have a bot will sustain food, but the other most important ingredient for life is water. And, uh, and fresh water resources are going to be a scarcity. Uh, and, and especially if the, the population increases in the non-legacy world, then uh, water is going to also play an extremely important role. Should we add a dimension to all of the energy technologies and add the water angle, in which case? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I talked about energy because this was an energy talk, but you know, energy and water actually are very deeply connected, and we should certainly uh, connect the two. I totally agree with you. I just didn't have an opportunity to talk about it. In fact, frankly, I don't know enough about it. I know more about the energy. But uh, they are absolutely deeply connected, and, and I hope some of the resources and the research goes into water as well. Okay. All right. Uh, how about we'll start over here. Oh, with you? Yeah. So did you look uh, at the environmental costs of these energy technologies? And I'm primarily referring to the uh, Fukushima disaster and the BP oil disaster. Um, no. I did not include the environmental cost. Um, I was deeply involved in the BP oil spill. Uh, I was part of Secretary Chu's science team. I can give you gory details and pictures of what actually happened. But we did not include that cost. In fact, I am, you know, one of the things we point out in this paper is that we ought to be including all the cost associated with each of the technologies so that the full you know, societal cost is reflected in what we pay for it. Well, it's not. We didn't do predicted something like Fukushima, and how do you assess that cost? Yeah, that, that is a difficult question. I mean, I, yeah, it, it's a, that's a hard question. I don't know exactly how to answer it. Um, but at least for the CO2 impact, we could potentially look at that. In fact, there's a lot of anal economic analysis of how to, you know, put the cost of CO2 on, on some of these technologies. In fact, there's been policy, the clean energy standard that I was talking about is a reflection of that, um, which is in policy right now. Okay, all right, I think I saw a hand over there. No? <laughs> I know, I'm trying to balance. <laughs> 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 She's the boss. <laughs> yeah, here we go, yeah. I'd like to ask a political question. 
Assuming the president is reelected, do you expect Secretary of Chu and his key uh, people to uh, remain on the job, or is there how is morale in the department? Yes. <laughs> So going back on uh, Stillman's comments on nuclear power, uh, now that Yucca Mountain is kind of being tabled for now, does the Department of Energy, what's the plan now to store nuclear waste? Oh, that's also a political question. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that the Secretary did when he, when he became the Secretary is to put together something called the Blue Ribbon Commission um, to look at the whole waste issue holistically um, and make recommendations, which there are now uh, at least two reports that have come out, um, and the recommendations are there. You know, one of the recommendations is to look at not just the fuel cycle, but the Nuclear Waste, waste Act policy, okay? And if you recall, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act got changed uh, from the original version, which is how we ended up in Yoka. And, um, and that needs to be revisited as well. So there's a, not just a departmental role, but there's a congressional role as well. But you know, I don't recall all the details of the report now, but I would encourage you to read it. Arun, thanks for an excellent talk. Um, could you go to that slide with all the different energy technologies? This one? No, the cost one. Ah, the Bloom Energy. Not Bloom Energy, Bloomberg. Bloom <laughs> <laughs> Energy is a little more expensive. <laughs> so the, the one that's not on there, and obviously you mentioned, that it's not in the study is, of course, energy efficiency. Yes. Which comes out to be cheapest of all. Yes. Down at two or three cents a kilowatt hour. I just wondered if you could kind of put that in, in perspective. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, we did not refer to this in our paper. And that's because we were asked to comment on the papers, the review papers, and none of them were in energy efficiency. So I redeemed myself by giving a lecture to the, the National Energy Efficiency Work, road mapping workshop that went happen last week. And uh, that's really a redemption on my part to say, hey, this is important, and this is what we should be doing. And yes, there are lots of, I showed appliance standards, and you have dealt with appliance standards deeply in DOE. And I think that's an excellent way to reduce the cost of energy, not just the life cycle, but the first cost. Um, buildings. Uh, we have, you know, we've designed Buildings based on building codes, and no one ever measures how they work, okay? If you look at lead rating, gold, platinum, I have another talk for another hour, which I won't bore you with, where the, if you look at the data, the rating of gold, platinum doesn't matter because they don't correlate with the building rating at, at all. In fact, if you try to make it more efficient, the actual energy use to the design value increases by a factor of two or three sometimes. So in fact, the rating don't, don't matter if you don't actually measure. This is the only large industry that I know that they build something that are not required to test. Imagine you're getting into a Boeing 787 <laughs> without having been tested. That's where the buildings industry and 75% of electricity goes into buildings. So I really think that there's some lessons learned from appliance standards where based on actual performance, and this is real engineering, the cost of sensing technology, and not just sensing, in using the sensor data in real time, I know that Martin Fisher is doing that out here, uh, there you go, um, is using the sensor data into the models and trying to find where the inefficiencies are and then using model predictive control to reduce. That's the technological side of it. But that has to go hand in hand with some requirement that you have to measure. Because as you know in the energy industry, either there's a price signal which drives things or there's a regulatory signal. Well, no one wants to raise the price of electricity. Okay? Everyone wants to go the other way. You've got to have a regulatory signal like a standard to be able to do that. So I think 
you know, it's a sort of chicken and egg. If you don't have the driver, people don't develop the technology because who's going to buy it? And the cost is high because you only have, can sell about five sensors. <laughs> if you have that, if you, the sensor cost can come down, the mesh networking you know, technology is all out there. It's just that it needs to be brought together to bring the whole fragmented industry towards a common goal of giving a performance, and no one does that today. And I think that's a major systemic issue in the stationary side. Okay, well, I think we have to wrap up, so uh, well, just- Please, I have to take my hands up since the beginning. <laughs> okay, one quick question. I took a shower today. One quick question and a quick answer. Okay, so Arjun, a good for presentation, good information, I think. Um, are you familiar with Paolo's work? He was here last week, did you see Berkeley? Yeah, Don, <laughs> Don DePaulo, yeah. yeah. So are you familiar with the carbon? Balance and how badly. I haven't seen his talk late, lately. <laughs> well, okay. you, you really should look at his place okay. and incorporate it into yours because there's really no justification for going to do combustible fuels at this point at all. Zero. Right? So, now the other thing is that. Uh, okay, can you make it for that? Sorry. It really has to go. Yes, if you want to make it here. Forget my question, it'll take longer. Sorry. Right, okay. so. So now in your electrofuel, for instance, uh, all of the sources that you have are actually solar power, except for you. All the rest, wind, hydro, everything else is solar power. And we know that the of those is so Why would you bother trying to construct fuels from inefficient sources of energy when a high temperature advanced cycle of nuclear power gives you fuels by carbon dioxide moving from air and seawater. Well, I mean, in transportation, you can go purely electric for transportation like light duty vehicles. Yeah. Okay? It's hard to do that for planes. No, you need you need liquid fuels. Yes, that's so, so, so if if you were to do it for planes, if you want to make it carbon free, yeah. okay, uh, you could go for solar. I mean, solar cells. Sun Power is making solar cells which are twenty three percent efficient. Yeah. Okay, and if the efficiency of converting that electricity, the electrons to fuel, is decent, so that the overall efficiency is about three or four percent. It's still better than biofuels. Yes. Okay. Which is the whole idea? Is that let's try out something. We don't know for sure whether it'll work, but unless you try, you'll never know. And so the idea was that hey, these are cycles, which are better than Calvin cycle in terms of efficiency of converting or carbon flux. And the electricity can come from renewable sources, and we know that we can convert, in a solar at least at twenty-five or maybe even higher, twenty-eight percent. Okay, and if you combine them, the overall system efficiency, if it's you know three or four percent, that's probably ten times better than what the biofuels can do. And the question is, will will it scale in cost? We don't know, and that's why you got to start doing something about it to see whether it'll scale or not. Okay, and unless you do it, you'll never know. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.